Natural disasters are inevitable, but recovery from a disaster takes time and energy and the involvement of people of faith. Today on Austin Faith Dialogue, we're going to be talking about disaster recovery. Stay with us. Austin Faith Dialogue, at the crossroads of religion and life, a series highlighting the cultural and social interactions between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KXAN. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. We're glad you joined us today on Austin Faith Dialogue when we're talking about ongoing disaster recovery. When the cameras go away, recovery still continues and people of faith are right there. People like Norm Heim, Director of Disaster Recovery for Lutheran Social Services. Right. Good to have you, Norm. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you, Sandy. Now, talk a little bit about what the scope of your work is in disaster recovery. Well, disaster, when it when it happens, a disaster brings a number of phases that follow. You have the rescue phase when people are trying to get out of harm's way, and you have the police and the National Guard and the rescue people working there. Then you have relief where people are trying to be stabilized into a safe, sanitary, secure environment. Red Cross, primary, Salvation Army, uh, the city and the county uh, emergency response people are all involved. Then you have the recovery phase, which is then building a new community. Everything, if it was a flood or a tornado, has been lost. And now you build to a new community. You can't replace what happened. It takes time for that. Usually, it's 100 times longer for recovery than the actual rescue phase. So if you had three days of rescue, you'll have 300 days of recovery, almost a year. Mm -hmm. So it takes time. And the faith community is part of that long-term recovery. We're here because we were here before the disaster, and we're, not, we're going to be here after the recovery. We're part of that bridge from before disaster to a new life. Now, this is really important and life-saving ministry. And we'll see, as you and I continue conversation, we'll see some pictures from time to time mm -hmm. of folks in actual disaster. Situations. I, I wonder how you got involved in this ministry. What, what special skills called you to this, Storm? I've been working in this about 25 years. And what brought me here was the need to help people recover, seeing the crisis in their lives, and seeing that there was not a way for a person to express their faith in the recovery process. And so we began working as early as the 1980 floods here in Austin with the uh, Shoal Creek flood. Some may still remember that. Mm -hmm. That's the beginning of flood relief and disaster response in the Austin area. Came out of a faith that says, God was with me before, He was with me during the disaster, and He's going to be with me afterwards. And how do I help build that bridge? So it's a natural response of, of people of faith wanting to help their, their friends and neighbors, right? That's correct. Now, your particular responsibility then is what? Administrative in terms of coordinating response? Right. I, I help develop the organization that continues, that provides the recovery workers. Bringing congregations together, bringing key leaders and pastors together, to say, how do we recover? How do we build a recovery program? That begins with the meeting, usually, of the pastors in the community. We talk about what is their, real, their role, what should they be doing. Pastoral care is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And so we want the pastors to be pastors and let lay people be lay people providing the hands and the, and the feet and the ears to listen to the stories. Once the recovery organization is in place, then usually some staff is hired, and they then bring in volunteers, and they bring in donations, and they bring in pastoral care, and they bring in the, the concerns of individual victims and persons affected by the flood or the tornado 
or the hurricane or the train accident that had happened in Round Rock here a number of years ago where mm -hmm. a pneumonia uh, car exploded. So then your work is, is creating the structure so that congregations can deliver whatever is needed That's to right. people affected, right? That's right. And we work as a faith community. It's not just Lutherans. It's Methodists and Episcopals and, past and Presbyterians and Seventh-day Adventists and Salvation Army and all the faith denominations coming together to work. Some of our Lutheran people have said, we have disaster fellowship with everybody. Unfortunately, we do. That's right. Now, ideally, I would suppose, a congregation would look at its preparedness before a disaster happens. How would you suggest a congregation go about that? One of the first things to do would be to provide a checklist uh, or to go through a checklist of what's going on in your congregation. Uh, have your fire extinguishers been inspected? Uh, are the exit lights on? Uh, do you have an emergency first aid kit? Do you have uh, 911 posted on the phone number, on the phones? Do, how do you, who's in charge if something happens? If somebody has a heart attack in the middle of worship service, who responds? Do you know where the nurses are in your congregation, where they sit on Sunday? Because, you know, everybody sits in the same spot every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, do you know where your nurses are, your doctors? Have you prepared for that? Then, um, have you taken a look at what are the needs of specially specialized populations, like uh, elderly or disabled or children or single parents? Where do they live? Because those are the ones that are going to be the most help if a flood happens or a tornado hits. How are you going to help them? Do you know where they are? Do you have a calling tree that is established in the congregation that is able to call all the members to find out how are they doing? Is everybody safe? If we were along the Gulf Coast, do we have a sister congregation back inland where our members could go and stay in the homes of our sister congregation. And for those in Austin, could you develop a sister congregation along the coast? If you happen to be Faith Lutheran, for example, mm -hmm. you could well take along and, and have Faith Lutheran in Corpus Christi as your sister congregation. So there's a lot of congregation really should do before a disaster happens. That's right. Now, we titled the show this week, flood recovery because we're going to be, especially in the second half, talking about specific efforts in the Victoria and the, and the Quero area. It, in your experience, has this disaster been particularly different from others that have happened in Texas on, on your watch? Sure. For example, this, f this flood that happened in October of last year started in New Braunfels and San Antonio and San Marcos and went clear to the coast. If you took the amount of river that was flooded, you'd have a river that's 2,200 miles long. Mm -hmm. That's a long flood. You have a tremendous amount of devastation that happened because it was unexpected. Then it rolled down the river, so it happened in New Braunfels on Sunday, and it happened in Seguin on Monday, and it happened in Quero on Wednesday, and, and so on. The, the amount of help provided by the church, by the faith community, from October through August of this year has amounted to over $4.5 million Amazing. of contributions from individuals and denominations to help those that were affected by the flood. There have been thousands and thousands of hours of volunteer work. These communities that were affected by the flood are to be congratulated because they've pulled together and they've, they've developed an organization like DeWitt County Cares or from the uh, uh, Victoria uh, Interfaith Disaster Response or Seguin Area Response or New Braunfeld Rebounds, all different kinds of names for people who are working together and that's been unusual. So the, the disaster was a, a huge geographical area, a lot of time, 
And what I'm struck by also is that things happened a year ago. So for many of us, the notion that there was a disaster is, is pretty well past. Mm -hmm. But the disaster is still there in Cuero and, and Victoria. So what stage are the folks in? We're in the recovery phase at this point where people are building this new community. But it takes time to do that. It takes time to get the funding from FEMA, from other, getting permits, deciding do you want to stay? Mm -hmm. Or if you're going to move, where are you going to move? How are you going to rebuild? Those are issues. Then to work through the grief that happens because you've lost. Six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years are all tick points along the line of grief that people are going to go through. We've just celebrated the anniversaries here in October of the flood last year. There were mm -hmm. tremendous ceremonies, and you'll hear something about that when we talk about when you talk with Jean and with the of the area of uh, Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to remember that the flood is the point in a person's life that's going to mark an event that they're going to remember from now on. It marks the event in the community, the floods of 98. Where were you? You'll know. You'll know in your own life as well as in the life of the community, right. right? So before we end the, the first half here momentarily, what would you want to say to the congregations of the greater Austin area about their involvement in the, these floods? First, people from your congregation to volunteer. We still need volunteers. Second, look at your own disaster plan. Do you have one in your congregation? Have you looked at what are the needs of particular groups in your congregation? We have some materials that we have available that you can write for or call, and we will send you. It's a checklist of what can you do in your congregation to prepare for a disaster. Also some things, some ideas of what you can do if a disaster strikes. I have it in a red folder, and it says, don't open this until a disaster strikes. Pull it out and now read it when the disaster. We'll be happy to share that with them. So there's a lot, a lot of help afterwards still needed in the uh, flooded areas as well as things congregations can That's do right. right here at home. Well, trust people will be in touch with you then. And uh, thanks, Norm, for well, being here for the, for the first half of the show. Thank you so much. And stay with us for the second half of Austin Faith Dialogue as we talk again about flood recovery. Thanks for staying with us for Austin Faith Dialogue as we're talking about flood recovery and the efforts that people of faith can bring to bear on the needs of people still affected by natural disasters. And this half of the show, we're talking with two folks who are actually working on site with uh, Jean Piercy and Dale Piercy, both of Lutheran Social Services, the disaster relief portions. Good to have you. Uh, thank you. Now, this is an unusual ministry to be involved in. So, Dale, let me ask you first get involved professionally in disaster recovery? Well, I think, um, I think when a person is young, they're instilled with this thing about helping their, their neighbor and what's right and wrong. And I think that's instilled into a person when you're young. And, 
and throughout the years I think it just builds and grows and uh, my wife and I are, are used to be construction uh, workers in in, uh, in our field before we got into the missionary field so we've we've worked a lot of our lives in the construction area and and uh, it just seemed to to fit when it came into a call that we felt several years ago to uh, do a little bit something else other than uh, working professionally and, and to, to put some of those things that we grew up with in our earlier years, those those things, those feelings of helping somebody else into action. Yeah. And that re that really is a unique ministry, especially as yes, for a, a woman in construction to also be a missionary. Yes, it is. <laughs> you're, you're an actual then commissioned missionary of the Lutheran Church? Um, our church at home in Miamisburg, Ohio, commissioned us as missionaries and sent us forth back in December of 96. And since then, we've traveled throughout U.S. territories and U.S. properties and such. We've been in the Virgin Islands and four different locations in South mm -hmm. Dakota, and now we're down here in Texas and enjoying the sunshine. And unfortunately, there are always too many disasters in, in too many parts of the world. So now, as I understand, you all did not come in first thing when the floods happened in, um, in the Victoria era, area and in the Quero area. You came later. So, Jean, why did you come later? What is it about the work that you do that has you coming in at a different point in the process? Um, we come in after the initial cleanup's been done um, because basically that is done uh, by local volunteers and um, you've got to get the funds available. Uh, just going through the paperwork and the red tape mm -hmm. and setting up the committees and all that kind of stuff that is involved in that, that takes a period of time and it's very rare to see it happen within four months and it's usually four to six months before they would send a person like me on a job to start coordinating the work efforts. And, and let's see, you two showed up this past June, as I recall. So when you got then to Querodale, what, what did you find there when you showed up? Well, when, when I got into Quero, there was, um, it was, there was still a lot of confusion going on. I mean, at that point, they were pretty well pu pulled together and they had um, initial assessments of the damages and the needs that needed to be done. And, and we were having some, um, some volunteers, they really didn't have a good direction. They were sent out on jobs and, and doing the best they can. And when they brought uh, Jeannie and I in, especially with me and Quero, they, uh, I would actually considered the construction coordinator. So I would co coordinate the jobs. I would uh, get materials on the jobs and the tools on the jobs. And, and I would see that everything that that uh, was needed to be done, either if they were skilled, then they could just take right off with it. If they were unskilled, then then I would stay on the job until they got comfortable with what they were doing, and uh, then I would I would let them go until and check up on them uh, occasionally throughout the day to make sure that they were doing okay. But uh, once we got the c construction coordinator part of it taken care of. Then, as the volunteers came in, then they, they had work already scheduled and mm -hmm. waiting for them to, to go to, to work, depending on their skills. And what I would do, I would put them in areas where they were, they were skilled or they were familiar with, or if they were, like I said, if they were unskilled, in an area that doesn't take a lot of skills, so that they could, they could actually work out what God had called them to, to quarrel for. And that's a, a good word for a lot of folks who aren't particularly skilled in construction, mm -hmm. but who maybe feel a call to know that uh, there's some hand-holding on the other end mm -hmm. and, and they'll be fine. What did you find in Victoria? Any special needs, say, different from what you had seen in other natural disasters that you'd worked in? Um, basically, your, your same problems, uh, they need support. Um, People, you know, they've lost their homes. And not only have they lost their homes, those possessions inside the homes. And you don't think about it, but where's your Christmas tree? Mm. Where's, where's your Valentine decorations? Where's your Easter bunny? And so when you send in volunteers, they are able to support that family through those times. What should a volunteer who, who says, okay, Jean, you know, sign me up, what should that volunteer show up with? Um, hammer in hand, or is that not really called for? 
It depends on the volunteer. Uh, some volunteers, they, they can do other things, but it's nice to have your own hand tools. Uh, that, that is beneficial, although we do have some of that stuff. Um, all the major big tools we have in a job trailer that we take around with us. But basically what they need is to have a willing heart, mm -hmm. to be willing to do whatever it takes to assist that person to get back into their home. And when you get them back into their home, then they can start rebuilding their whole life again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the actual floods in Victoria and Quero happened um, a ago. So wasn't there a sort of an anniversary celebration just recently? Maybe you can tell us about that, Dale. Uh, there was, yeah, there was an anniversary celebration in Quero, and uh, I think I was not able to be with at the one in Victoria, but uh, Quero, it was, uh, it, it was put on by a lot of the, the the heads of the city and and some of the some of the victims, and and uh, it turned out real nice. It was rather cold that night. It was one of those cold snaps that came through, so we were. It was held outside. It was, it was it kept everybody shivering pretty much, but. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, uh, there was a very good one in Victoria, and I was not able to be there for that one. But, but uh, so was there something <clears throat> special then that the folks did in uh, in Victoria to mark the year anniversary? Uh, they had several different little programs in their year's anniversaries, and they had a clown that came in and put on little skits for the uh, children. They had face painting and different things like that, but the, it was actually a show that was actually put on by the flood victim saying thank you. And to some of us, I suppose, that might seem a strange thing to do, to, to stop and remember this horrible thing that happened and that changed everybody's lives forever. But why is it important for a community to do this? It's part of the healing process. Um, if someone gives you a helping hand and you're carrying an armload of packages and you need mm -hmm. a helping hand, don't you turn around and say thank you? Well, this is just on a bigger scale. You've come in and you've helped them rebuild their homes. You've helped them get back into their houses. You've helped their lives go forward. And they want to turn around and say thank you. So it's a, it's a ministry. It's not just showing up with a hammer and a saw. It's really ministering to the person. Most definitely. It? Most definitely. I wonder if in Victoria or Quero, because you're, you're in Quero, mm -hmm. Dale, I wonder in Quero what changes you've noticed in the community in the several months that you've been there? Not just the, the physical changes of houses being rebuilt, but are there other things that you can point to? Well, I, I noticed that uh, th there's a lot of other people help, helping each other. I mean, it, it got to a point there in Quero that, that um, uh, I think people had dealt with this flood so much they just got burnt out. But uh, we've got several volunteers that are, are on a three-week stay that, that's going to help us for actually for nine weeks. And as they see the people coming in, as they see the volunteers coming in, the other people are excited about getting things back to normal again. They finally see a little bit of hope coming back into the town. Although we don't have an, enough skilled volunteers at this time, but they see this group and they say, well, maybe I'm so there's a whole different kind of a hope that's going on with the, with the victims right now. And, and in fact, in, in one way, the, uh, uh, we've helped uh, several people that says, now you've helped me. When you need help, give me a call, and I'm going to volunteer and help somebody else. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great building a community when, uh, when things start to come back together again. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm for volunteers and for the affected alike. Right. But now you said that you don't have enough skilled people. Who are the kinds of people you'd like to plead for? Well, electricians and plumbers. There's always a need for electricians and plumbers, but of, of course we need uh, carpenters, drywall hangers, and, and finishers. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to say that we can only use skilled. We can use semi-skilled, and we can use unskilled as well but at, at this point in the disaster a lot of the unskilled work has been done uh, the painting the cleaning out the mm -hmm. cleaning up the hauling away of the trash and now we're into some of more of the skilled areas of course being skilled myself I, I know that it's always nice to have uh, another unskilled person with me to 
you know, to hand me this or to do something else uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. that I can directly uh, supervise them over. So we can use all kinds. Okay, I hope uh, people are listening and, <laughs> and they will respond then. Mm -hmm. And in just a few weeks, ideally, you'll be done in Victoria. So then what, the whole organization falls apart, goes away? What happens next in Victoria? As far as myself, as all the projects, as far as construction, when they finish, then I'll join Dale and Quero and give an assistance there as uh, on-site supervising and that kind of thing. But the actual organization will stay there. The Victoria Interfaith, it will be there. And that way, as things come up in the future, um, not a flood to that magnitude, I hope, but if there's anything else that goes on, if, you know, there's houses that burn down and different things like that, they can come in and they can assist. And that's something that's very good to see happening is that this interfaith is taking hold and it's getting all the churches working together and it's not just going out and this church is helping here or there. It is the church of God that's going out to help. A nice model to, to leave them with. And I, I wonder, I think we've got time for one more question here. This is demanding work, it sounds like to me. How, how do you all keep up without burning out? Well, yes, it is. There's, there's a lot of stress involved in uh, the inner parts of the organization and keeping things going. And um, fortunately, Jeannie and I have each other. And she can watch me, I can watch her, and, and we can see each, uh, with each other uh, if there's a stress point, if, if somebody's getting overworked. And it can happen. It can happen with the, the best of the caregivers. Uh, they can get burnt out and not even realize it. Um, and sometimes you can get burnt out and, and maybe recover in a week or two weeks or you may never recover. So it's, it's a very stressful thing to, to, uh, to be in the caregiving part, to, to see somebody that's hurting each and every day. And you have to have that special kind of a balance, a balance that says, okay, I'm I'm giving this part for someone else, but I also have to take care of myself, and I think God knows that as well. So. That which says a, a lot about uh, doing this work as a faith-based person, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Well, thank you both for, for talking with us about the stages of recovery and reminding all of us about the importance of working together. Thanks, Jean and Dale. Well, it's been you. really good to have you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this week on Austin Faith Dialogue. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week.